In the studio this segment here, I have Clovis Campbell. He is the publisher of the Arizona Informant newspaper and uh, part of a really spectacular family. How are you doing today, sir? <laughs> doing great. Another great day in paradise here in Phoenix, Arizona. Cool. Um, tell us a little bit about your family because um, you guys might be modest, but you've done some interesting things here in the, the state of Arizona for African American people. So, well, I guess, I guess it really starts with my father and the fact that him coming back into Arizona back in the early '40s, late '30s, along with his brothers and sisters. Uh, he, you know, his parents died when he was a kid, so he continued his education and finished college and. Ended up as the first African American state senator in the state of Arizona in the oh, 60s. Wow. Yeah, so that was, that was a pretty big deal back then. Uh, he also worked to find, found, help found the uh, national uh, uh, NC, N, NBCSL, which is the na Black National Black Caucus of State Legislators. Okay, um, you know that's going on now. I was a member uh, after my dad finished his uh, ten years in office. He worked at Arizona Public Service, but started our newspaper, which is the Arizona Informant. I followed him in his footsteps there after college and then kind of continued on and jumped into the state legislature and politics for a little while myself. Right. You, you represented, uh, at the time it was District 16, right? Yeah, actually it was the same district that he represented. And mm -hmm. uh, a funny note is that uh, when I won my first election uh, to that exact day, uh, uh, 40 years to that exact date, I won by the same amount of the votes that he did was 60 votes. Wow. Yeah. So it was, it was, Does that, like, trip him out? <laughs> well, unfortunately, he wasn't around. You know, oh, he had passed okay. away. I got elected in 2006, and he passed away in 2004. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, what What do you guys try to accomplish with the informant in terms of the stories that you cover? Well, you know... It, 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 he purchased it in 1971. Informant was a brand, and they printed about four or five issues in 1958. And he was actually a writer for that newspaper back then. It kind of folded rather quickly, but the name was still available. So he went out, and in 1971, as a member of the state legislature, they weren't really uh, writing about all the things that he was doing. So he said, well, I'll just buy my own newspaper. So he and his brother, my Uncle Charles, got together and they bought the newspaper for a dollar. And, wow. uh, yeah, it wasn't much to it, just the name. And uh, so they started publishing there just to get the word out and to talk positively about what's happening in the black community. Mm -hmm. Because at the time, you know, a lot of newspapers were putting things in about civil rights and anti-black power and all this. When he wanted to show some positive um, uh, people doing positive things in the black community, specifically black folks, and so that was his way to do it, and it worked out uh, pretty well. Forty-five years later, we're still here. Hmm. What, what do you think is um, the main difference between when your dad started the paper and how people consume news today? Oh, it's, it's uh, vastly different. I mean, when, I, when it started out as a kid, I would actually uh, ride with him in the car, and we'd throw the newspapers Ooh. to the doorsteps of people. We weren't even charging. We were giving it away for free. Okay. Just in hopes that people would, uh, you know, kind of look at it and enjoy it. And eventually, uh, well, you know, one time some people even would throw it back at me when I throw it in the newspapers, <laughs> when I throw it in the yard. So, you know, that was interesting. But now, as you see, people consume information in a lot of different ways. You know, you've got the social media, you've got digital platforms, you've got a little bit of everything. So, you know, but the one thing that's valuable is that uh, when you go around people's offices and talk to them and they, you're doing interviews with them, you will always find somewhere on the wall something cut out from a newspaper that they did. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a way of preserving history like no one else can. Uh, it's a way of preserving black history. Uh, one of the things we say on our newspaper is we record black history every day. Mm -hmm. And it holds true. I mean, we've got pictures from, so I'm looking at our... Um, at our archives, and we've got some phenomenal pictures from the last 45 years. Some of the events that were never captured by the daily newspapers or some of the mainstream media. And so we have a pretty extensive collection, along with some of the other black newspapers around the country. So uh, when you look at what a black newspaper does, it, we're still in print, but we're also, uh, you know, we have the digital access, uh, we have the website, we have social media, and we'll actually be going online where you can purchase your subscription starting in November. The same type of newspaper you see, it'll be just online, and you can, instead of people that don't want to get it and have that ink on their hands, they can look at it online and do those things. So we're, we're, we're covering all bases on, as far as media is concerned. Um, 
Are you, do you just publish in Phoenix, or do you get into other parts of the state? No, we're, we're statewide. Uh, okay. That's one of the things that we tried to do was make sure that we cover every area of the other states. So we have some writers in Tucson, some in Sierra Vista, some in Flagstaff. Okay. So we're all over the state, and, uh, you know, it's easier to get information now. Uh, several years ago, back in the day, you know, we'd wait. You know, I used to go to the, uh, a lot of our writers used to send their stories to us on the bus. So, wow. so yeah, so they would drop all their, they write all their notes, and then they put the pictures in the notes and uh, fold it up and put it on the Greyhound bus, and we go to the bus station and pick it up or we wait for it in the mail. But back then, the bus was quicker. That was like next day or same day service. Uh, so that was, you know, that shows how much time has changed. Now a lot of writers are just virtual. They sit out anywhere they want, email it over, <laughs> photos come in. It's a pretty nice thing. Um, out, of, out of all the years that you've published, maybe what's the, the most um, significant story that you think that impacted the black community in the state of Arizona? Well, you know, there, there have been several. I think that um, in, in my era, uh, you know, clearly when um, President Barack Obama was elected, uh, that was probably the most significant thing that, that we talked about. You know, I was fortunate enough to be able, when I was uh, in the legislature, he was here campaigning, and uh, I talked to him on the phone to come to Phoenix, and he had been to Phoenix two or three times, but he had never met with people in the African-American community. I said, I said, you know, you've come to town and you've met with the Native Americans, you've met with the LGBT community, but you haven't sat down with our African-American community. He said, hey, you set it up, and uh, I'll make sure that I'm there to talk to the community. So when he came to speak at ASU, I don't know if you remember that. He spoke, on, he spoke on the grounds at ASU when he was campaigning. And we had set up to meet with him before hand in one of the rooms. So I had a list I had put about 100 names together. And a lot of people in the community were there. You know, everybody expected him to come in and, you know, say a couple of words and, mm -hmm. and jam out. He stayed in there for an hour and a half with us. Wow. Signed, out, signed autographs, all his books, uh, talked about a lot of different things, took a ton of pictures with us. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a remarkable man. So, and then later on that night, we were doing a fundraiser for him at... Uh, the Wyndham, or what is now the Renaissance downtown, right. mm -hmm. and uh, I had the opportunity to introduce him there as well. So, you know, I've seen him several times over the past several years, so, I mean, that, that was the highlight in my era as far as I'm concerned. You, you know, that the, now that you say that, I, I remember on the night he got elected, mm -hmm. I called my stepfather, who at the time I think was in his early 70s, mm -hmm. so he was born like in the 40s, right. like tail end of the Great Depression, right before World War II. And I didn't realize it at the time, mm -hmm. but he started crying. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, I'll tell you, we had that night of the election, uh, myself, uh, I, I got reelected. You know, what we, we, myself was on, I was on the ballot. Uh, Cody Williams was a judge that was running the South Phoenix. He was on the ballot. Uh, Mike Johnson was on the ballot. Mm -hmm. Uh, Senator Lee Landrum Taylor, Sandra Kennedy. So what we did was we put together a big uh, watch party for the uh, results, and we did it at downtown. It used to be called Stoudemire's, okay, now yeah, it's called The Park. Mm -hmm. And we partnered with the uh, Greater Phoenix Black Chamber at the time. Ron Busby was the president then. We had almost 600 people down there, all wow. black folks. We had the red carpet treatment, and 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 when it and when it was announced, you, you talk about people crying, man. It was it was definitely. A love fest over there, but it was it was intense. But it was the biggest. It was the African American uh, uh, watch party for the state, and we had TV cameras there, everything. It was awesome. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about the school that was named after your dad. I, I just found that out. I was like, oh, really? <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that my dad wrote a book before he passed away, and it was called "I Refuse to Leave the Hood," and uh, you know. We were all born in, I was born in South Phoenix. He moved to South Phoenix when he was a kid and stayed there. We still have a home there. I live in South Phoenix now in a different home. And, uh, you know, what happened was they were getting ready to build a new school in the South Phoenix area at the time. And they were trying to figure out, you know, what do we name it? Who do we name it after? And I was sitting at the, one of the meetings. And I said, well, you know, guys, why do you want to consider naming it after my dad? He's been around here a while. He's done a few things. And we took it to the school board, and they, they agreed to it. So uh, a few mm -hmm. years later, you know, the groundbreaking ceremonies went on, and and, uh, and back in 2000 or so, he the school was named after him, and it's been history since. And now I live right down the street from the school on 24th Street in Bayside. Cool. Mm -hmm. cool. 
And it's a, it's a K through 8th grade school? K through 8th grade. Uh, it's the number one school in the Roosevelt School District as far as academics. Wow. And it's in the top 10 or top 15 schools in the state wow. as well. So they're doing well uh, in, in academics, and they got some great kids there, great okay. principal. Okay. Um, let's shift a little bit. I'm just curious. Um, I didn't grow up here in Arizona. <laughs> I'm part of that wave that said I'm getting the heck out of the East Coast. <laughs> Absolutely. We, we <laughs> need welcome some you here. <laughs> um, for those of us who haven't been here and don't have the history that you have in terms of, of growing up in the state, um, educate us a little bit. Has, has there ever been like a historically black part of Phoenix or a historically black community um, in you know different parts of the state? Like, for instance, in New York, we had Harlem. Um, in Chicago, we had the South Side. Mm-hmm. You know, San Francisco even had a black community. You know, section at one point. Yeah, I mean, it, it's no different than any other uh, major city in the country. You know, everybody asks, "Well, Phoenix is slow, and Phoenix doesn't have black people." To the contrary, you know, I've been around the country. I've been to all those cities you just named, and, and, and have learned some of that history. And we have some of the same history here. South Phoenix was the spot where African Americans had to live. Anything. Uh, south of uh, Van Buren Street, uh, okay. that's where all the black folks lived. You, black people couldn't even buy a home north of Van Buren. The mm-hmm. deeds actually said on the deeds that, that you could not sell this land to Negroes. So uh-huh. um, back then, you know, everybody mm-hmm. lived in that area. And uh, matter of fact, Cody Williams, the judge, uh, whose wife is now the chief of police, mm-hmm. uh, his father was actually the home builder in that area. So he built all the homes in the South Phoenix area. And, uh, you know, my father bought one of those, and his dad was also my dad's campaign manager when he started, first started out in politics. Mm-hmm. So he had a real rich history. And you got schools like Martin Luther King named down there, uh, Percy L. Julian named after the chemist. Uh, that's where I went to both of those schools. So you got a lot of historical names and a lot of historical black names of schools in that Roosevelt School District area. So that's where most of the folks lived at the time. And then when the uh, real big issue came where everybody could move out in the 70s, uh, you've seen people start moving to Scottsdale, to uh, West Side, to Glendale. A lot of people moved into Chandler and mm-hmm. Tempe. But uh, South Phoenix was the hub for the black community. Anything that was going on in South Phoenix, in South Phoenix, that's where the black folks are. How has that impacted our political and economic strength or, or power? Well, um, you know, that was the district where we had guaranteed black representation at the time. Um, you know, even from... Before my dad was in the Senate, he was in the House of Representatives, and he, before he was in the House of Representatives, they had a couple of people before him, uh, Hazel B. Daniels, which is a well, he was a well-known uh, lawyer. They named the Black Lawyers Association after him. He was a first black uh, legislator in Arizona. He also had a guy named J.D. Holmes. They both represented and came from the South Phoenix area. Horace Owens, Leon Thompson. So we had uh, several black people in the area, and then there were a few people outside on the outskirts where some of the districts were a little bit uh, black people lived in some of those smaller districts uh, there were some folks there, Art Hamilton uh, folks like that so there was a concentration of African Americans in the legislature and I'm not saying the concentration no more than maybe four or five at a time but you know that was the, that was big. Now you look at it, uh, Reginald Boulding who's sitting in the House of Representatives in my seat mm-hmm. he's the only one out of 90 people mm-hmm. so uh, we got some work to do mm-hmm. So what what work do you think needs to be done? Well, I think, you know, black people have to understand that uh, they can run for uh, um, political races outside of South Phoenix. You know, everybody doesn't have to run against each other in that one area. Uh, you know, white people have to vote for us because they expect us to vote for them. Mm-hmm. So well, why wouldn't we expect them if we move to Scottsdale or Tempe or Chandler and we got a qualified candidate that's black? Why shouldn't he have just as good a chance of running? It doesn't have to be representing a black neighborhood, but he's an American first and an Arizona second, Mm -hmm. and he's black. Why not vote for him, too? And so I think we got to really start recruiting those folks outside of the South Phoenix area and that live all around the state. And we're starting to see that. We've got some black elected city council people in uh, Avondale. You've got Brian Kilgore in uh, Eloy. You have... um, uh, Valerie Valerie Woolridge and Sierra mm-hmm. Vista. You have Alicia Ash and, 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 and a couple other people. So we've got some representation throughout the state, even in Flagstaff. We've got yeah, the first Coral, black female, Coral, Coral Evans. Evans. Yeah. yeah. So there's some folks doing some things. we got to keep doing that and do more of it. Mm-hmm. 
Let's talk a little bit about the uh, Arizona Commission of African American Affairs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you pause for a second. Is that a good thing? Oh, it's, a it's thing? <laughs> absolutely a good thing. You know, it's a good segue into that because Senator Leah Landrum Taylor and myself, when we were the last two in the Senate, she was the Senate seat and I was in the House in District 16 at the time, which is now 27. We kind of saw that there may be an opportunity to create something for African Americans that were unique, and knowing that we might not have a chance to have any representation at the Capitol since there were only two seats out of 90, now one. So we created the uh, commission to be the liaison for the African American community of the entire state. Hmm. Now keep in mind, as we were the only blacks in Arizona in the State House of Representatives and the Senate, even though we didn't, people didn't live in our district that were black, they would call us up to represent them, even though they had other legislators who were their actual representatives. And so we created this to be able to have that voice between the governor's office and the community, the legislative branch, the judicial branch, and anything happening in the state. So that if there's something that concerns black people, we wanted to let them know from the top down. And uh, that commission was created out of statute not something that the governor can remove. You know, a lot of times now they're talking about uh, the governor wants to get rid of some of the commissions because they say there's too many of the boards and commissions. Well, this one he can't do because we well, we, we voted for it in legislation, so it's a statute. And it's gotten a uh, line item in the budget. Uh, you know, now I'm the director of that, and we're doing some good things. You know, our goal is to make folks aware of the legislation that they put out may not be in the best interest of black people in the state of Arizona. So what are some of the things that the, the commission has accomplished so far? Well, you know, there have been a uh, few pieces of legislation that we didn't like uh, that we talked to the governor about. And even after it passed through both chambers of the House, we talked to the governor and he vetoed it. One was um, a couple of years ago, they had some legislation that talked about um, being able for the police officers to, to review the tapes and, uh, and not look at them, and not let the other people look at them for 90 days, and mm -hmm. then the police officers could change. Yeah, they could change their mind and change their story. So uh, we we said that's not a good thing. We need to know what the police officers are thinking right now when they did what they did. And so he vetoed that bill after a lot of uh, legend, a lot of lobbying from us. And then he also, you know, with the payday loan situation, I've been fighting that since I was in office uh, over 10 years ago. Well, it keeps coming back, and every year we got to make sure that we make sure that it doesn't come back into legislative form. So for the last couple of years, they've been bringing back a bill of some kind about payday loans. Really? This year, yeah, this year they call it flex loans. And so next year they'll call it so, something else. So let's just stop for a second. So just so you're, you're clear for the audience, every year the legislature tries to pass a new payday loan law to, oh. re, to bring it back and make it law, legal again? Absolutely. Absolutely. The payday loan uh, industry has uh, a lot of money. And so they pay a lot of lobbyists a lot of money to go and talk to people and try to encourage them to bring that business back into Arizona. We've been fortunate enough to have people understand that they prey only on people who are of minority descent. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are no payday loans in Scottsdale. They're all in, you know, they're all in the minority communities, and those interest rates are incredibly high and unfair for people to get caught up into. And a lot of times people end up losing their homes, losing their cars, losing whatever property that they have mm -hmm. just because they've taken a loan. But if they miss one or two payments, right. the interest rate is so high that it's 10 times more than the amount of the loan itself. Mm -hmm. So we've been very fortunate in, 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 in working to continue to defeat that initiative. But I guarantee you come November, we'll be talking about it again. Um, just in the few minutes we have left, mm -hmm. what are some things that you guys at the commission are working at right now that well, you need help with? You know, one of the things that has been um, serious in the African American community and in minority communities, period, and I worked on this again 10 years ago, was the fact that our students, African American students, are getting kicked out of school disproportionately for smaller things. Mm -hmm. And so when you see what happens with our kids is that, uh, if, say if you're in a classroom you may mouth off or you may do something kind of, you know, what a kid would do normally. Mm -hmm. uh, since you're black, instead of you just going into detention or ISS, they're kicking you out of school. So you uh -huh. end up, yeah, you end up losing school time. You end up getting put into a system that now your only option is to end up getting into trouble since you got downtime at home. You're, out, you're not in school. You don't have any school. So, so wait a minute. When you say kick you out of school, meaning you can't go to another school. You can't go to You can't school. go back. You so your only option is to get a GED or GED, something. or if you can get into a charter school, but now 
they've uh, written into law that charter schools do not have to accept students who have been kicked out of another school. And most of the students, say. most of the students kicked out of the other school are what black kids. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a way that they're trying to create that prison pipeline, which we're fighting all also is we're fighting against um, uh, privatized prisons all the time. Uh, because once you let people say that you can make money off of putting people in prison beds, then the main first thing they got to do is start arresting folks to fill up those prison beds. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, the most folks that get arrested, as we know, are black folks. Mm -hmm. So uh, those are a couple of things that we're working on. We're also going to work on some health things to talk about health in the minority community, the African American community in particular, since we're talking about the health care issues in the, at the national level with Obamacare and Trump care or whatever we're going to call it, if it, show, if it ever shows up, uh, there's still some issues that have to take place, and you're talking about making sure people have the proper health care. Hmm. Oh, you could have kept going. I was just checking <laughs> my time. <laughs> uh, we, we've got a lot of things that on, on our plate at the uh, legislature, I mean at the uh, commission, because we are right there at the state capitol. Our office is right on the third floor of the governor's tower, so we have access to the governor as well. Um, how important is it, because I know a lot of people will say just vote for folks, and mm -hmm. we do that a lot, that's cool, but how important is it for us to maybe find that extra hundred dollars that we can give to a candidate, or, or maybe invest in a, a political race? You know, man, it's, it's very important, and a lot of people don't understand just how important their dollars are, and what it means when you give to a campaign, and you give to a certain uh, candidate. That means that you put your trust in them, but that means that you know, as a candidate I myself, I noticed who gave money to me. And I noticed when they needed something from me, you know, it's not that you have to give me money to be on to be able to get a you know, response from me, but you're definitely gonna respond to folks that give you money and, 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 and make a contribution to the campaign. But at the same time, it lets them know that you're involved in the community and you expect something from them and expect for them to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, Clovis Campbell. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, real quick, how can people find out more about the informant or maybe if they want to uh, possibly subscribe, how can they do that? Oh, absolutely. You can uh, either call the office at 602-257-9300 uh, or you can go to our website, www.azinformant.com. And then also, as far as the commission is concerned, you can reach us also there at 602-542-5484. Or you can go to that website, azcaaa.az.gov. Cool. And give, give us that website one more time, just in case. The, uh, the commission website, commission. the Arizona Commission of African American Affairs, is azcaaa.az.gov. Cool. Because I know I'd get that message. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again for being here. Hey, it's a pleasure it. being here. I appreciate it.